Okay, are we, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, um, well, thank you for coming today. My name's Father John Bear. I'm from uh, England, but I've lived the last 25 years in America, in New York, St. Vladimir's Seminary. Okay. I did my doctoral work in Oxford University 30 years ago, and under Metropolitan Callister Square. Um, Married, if you tell me if I'm going too slow or too quick for you, if I'm going too quick for you, okay, just... Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if I'm going too quick, you stop me, otherwise I'm just going to carry on, okay? Um, I did my doctoral work with Metropolitan Callister Square, and I'm really thankful to him, especially for recommending that I work on St. Irenaeus of Lyon, okay? St. Irenaeus of Lyon was a Christian writer, came from Asia Minor, lived in Gaul at the end of the second century. He was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of St. John the Theologian. Okay, so a, there's continuity between them. I spent the better part of a decade working on Irenaeus. I was then invited to teach at St. Vladimir's Seminary. I've been teaching ever since. Um, and I wrote a series of books. I made my way all the way up to the sixth century, but then I got pulled backwards. Okay, so I went back and I did a, a work on Origen, a second work on Irenaeus, and I've just finished a book on the Gospel of John. And that's where we are for the talk today, about the Gospel of John. Um, it, it might seem a very circuitous way of getting to the Gospel of John, but there's a reason for what I'm going to do. Okay? I want to try and explain to you why the Gospel of John is as it is, why it's different from the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, why it's so different, especially when it comes to the Passion, okay, with, with Christ crucified. He doesn't say from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, rather, it's finished. Yeah, so what's finished? Why? And why is he not crying out in abandonment? What's going on between them? Okay. Again, if I'm talking too fast, especially for those who are native Estonians and, and have learned to speak English, I'm going too fast. Do, do stop me. If you're not following me, I'm going to turn the tables on you in a minute. I'm going to start asking you questions. Okay? So, um, why is the Gospel of John like it is? And I think the way to get into that is to start with Irenaeus. We're going to look at a passage from him. Then go to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke and then go to the Gospel of John. And I think doing all of that will have a much better understanding of what Christian theology is, how it holds together, and what the Gospel of John is in its particularity. Okay, are you ready? Yes. Okay. We're going to start with the first quotation on your sheet. You should all have a, a handout in front of you. This is a letter, almost certainly written by Irenaeus, it's called The Letter of the Church of Vienna and Leon to Asia and Phrygia. It was written in the year 177 AD. In 177, there was a... Don't, don't read it yet. We're going to read through it together. In 177, there was a massive persecution of the Christians living in Leon. Okay? There had been martyrdoms before that, but this was the first time the Christians were gathered together, taken into the arena, and... Um, uh, if, the wild beast led in. Okay, it's the first pogrom of, of Christians. Um, Irenaeus is writing this letter, describing what had happened in Vienne and Lyon, and sending it back to Asia and Phrygia. A lot of the Christians in Lyon were migrants from Asia Minor, like Irenaeus himself was. So it's a, the, the letter's preserved for us by Eusebius. So when it says Eusebius, H-E, that's Historia Ecclesiastica, book five of the, of the ecclesial history. Okay. Now, this letter is quite long, and the heroine of the letter is a figure called Blandina. Yeah? And she really is my heroine. I really wanted to call my daughter Blandina, but my wife wouldn't have it. She said, it just doesn't work in, in, in American English. It'd be shortened to bland Blandina or something like that. It doesn't work. Um, she's a heroine. More space is given to her in the letter than any other figure. Okay. She's a young slave girl. She's probably about 12 or 13 years old. She's female and she's a slave. More space is given to her than anybody else. Her mistress is a Christian, 
but her mistress is not even named. Her mistress goes to Merton, but she's not even named. Blandine is the focus of attention. Okay, so why would that be the case? Why would Blandina be the focus of attention? I'm asking you. Fell in love. Pardon? <laughs> she fell in love. No. I, 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 I'm asking you with a purpose, because I want to get you thinking in a particular way. Why would it be important that she's a young slave girl? The heroine of the whole story is not the rich and powerful aristocratic <coughs> woman, okay. who was also martyred, but a young slave girl. And if but, Yeah, but her, her mistress was martyred. Why is it important that she's a young slave girl? That more space is given to the young slave girl than to the aristocratic woman who owned her, who was also martyred. She's not even named. Why is it important she's a young slave girl? Feminist. There we go, Fem <laughs> feminist movement. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, <laughs> carry on thinking in, in that land. Just, uh, yeah. Uh, to, uh, would be the male and property and okay. And okay. You're getting there. So now put it put it in the other way round. It, 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 in the ancient world, it's a patriarchal society. Yeah, very strong patriarchal society. That means she is what? Mm, deprived. Deprived even more. She's young. She's female, and she's a slave. She's as <laughs> low as you can possibly be. She, she's young, she's, tw she's not an adult yet, yeah? She's a non-person, she's a slave, she's a non-person, she's female, she's, a, she's on the lowest level of society, okay? But the question is still there, why is that important? Why is it important? We've identified an aspect of it, but why is that important? Yeah, okay, so she's the lowest. Yeah. Can you think of other words like that? That's really good. You, I want to get you thinking scripturally. What we said so far is thinking historically or societally. She's the lowest of the low. But why scripturally is that important? She's the weakest of the weak. So you've got in the gospel, you've got all of these inversions. Yeah. The most emphatic one is the word of Christ to Paul. My strength is made perfect in, in weakness. Yeah? My strength is made perfect in weakness. So if she's the lowest of the low, if she's the weakest of the weak, then she becomes the vessel for the strength of God. Most perfectly. Yeah? And so that's what's emphasized throughout all of this. So it describes for pages about how she was brutalized by the gladiators, you know, whipped, beaten, hit with whatever, all, all these kind of things. And then it says that the gladiators were exhausted while she wasn't. Yeah. So let's look at the first quotation there. First part of the quotation. For while we all trembled, and her earthly mistress, who was also one of the witnesses, but she's, not, she's a martyr, but she's not, not named, feared that on account of the weakness of her body, she would be unable to make bold confession. Blandina was filled with such power as to be delivered and raised above those who were torturing her by turns from morning till evening in every way, so that they, the torturers, acknowledged that they were conquered and could do nothing more to her. And they were astonished at her endurance as her entire body was mangled and broken and they testified that one of these forms of torture was sufficient to destroy life, not to speak of so many and so great sufferings. But the blessed woman, like a noble athlete, renewed her strength in her confession, and her comfort and recreation and her relief from the pain of her suffering was in exclaiming, I am a Christian, there's nothing vile done by us. So the gladiators are the ones who are exhausted while they're beating her up. Yeah? And they cannot, they're, they're totally amazed at her endurance. So this paradox of strength in weakness. She's the lowest of the low, the weakest of the weak. She becomes the vessel for the power of God. You with me so far? Okay, now it's going to get difficult. It carries on. Um, after, so you see paragraph 18 to 19. Yeah? And then we're going to jump to 41 to 42. So uh, there's a lot of description about how she was being beaten up in that time. Then it carries on. 
Blandina, hung upon a stake, epixilu. What, does anybody here know Greek? What does xilu mean? Wood, yeah? And so what's your immediate reference? She's hung upon the wood. The cross, okay? So it's, it's not just a stake. The, the echo is... The, the, there's an echo here, yeah? You're supposed to be thinking of the cross. So Blandina, hung upon a stake, was offered as food for the wild beasts that were let in. She, by being seen hanging in the form of a cross, by her vigorous prayer, caused great zeal in the contestants. As in their struggle, they beheld with their outward eyes, through the sister, him who was crucified for them, that he might persuade those who believe in him that everyone who suffers for the glory of Christ has forever communion with the living God. The small, weak, despised, see the emphasis, small, weak, despised woman had put on the great and invincible athlete Christ, routing the adversary in many bouts and through the struggle being crowned with the crown of incorruptibility. So now she's not only the vessel of the power of God, but she's actually become identified with Christ. Yeah? They looked at her and with their outward eyes, they saw through the sister him who's crucified for them. So she's become identified with Christ. It's really dramatic language. Okay? But the question then is, who sees her as an image of Christ? And I'm asking you, who sees, who, who looks at her and sees Christ? So it, it, it specifically says, she caused great zeal in the contestants. That's not the torturers. The contestants are the other people being martyred. Yeah, the, the Christians alongside her in the arena. As they in their struggle beheld the outward eyes through the sister, him who was crucified for them. Okay? So it's the other Christians in the arena that look at her and see the image of Christ. So that's the first important lesson. Where do you have to be to see her as an image of Christ? Yeah, you have to be in the arena alongside her. Yeah? If you're sitting like a good Roman citizen in the amphitheater, looking down at the spectacle, what are you seeing? Well, now what are you seeing? You're seeing a 13-year-old girl being torn apart by the lions for your amusement. Yeah? If you want to see her as an image of Christ, you've got to be in the amphitheater, uh, in the arena with her. Is that clear? Yeah? Really clear? Okay, let me ask the question again. Who sees her as an image of Christ? The other Christian. Well, you've had that one. I want a different answer. Yeah. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> Where'd you get it from? <laughs> the lion sees as an image of Christ. Where, where do you get it from? Yeah, we've had that answer. I want a different answer. We've had that answer. Okay, the text says it's the other Christians in the arena who are going to die. They look at her and they're encouraged. They see the image of Christ, yeah? Okay, we've had that answer. I want a different answer. Who see Christ himself, where do you get that from? Where do you get it from? You're making it up. <laughs> yeah? I, I've gotten, I'm sure he does, but where are you getting it from? Okay, students get really annoyed with me at the seminary <laughs> because I ask a question and my, my thought is down at this level and they always come back with a big theological answer. Yeah? I want a very concrete answer. Who sees her as the image of Christ? Yeah, excellent! St. Irenaeus. Why? He's the author of the letter. We don't know, but he's the author of the letter. Yeah? So what we've done, we're thinking on different levels now. We're on one level, it's what the text says. And the text says that those in the arena looked at her and saw Christ. Yeah? Um, when I asked who else, you gave me other answers, like the lions or, the, or, or Jesus himself, yeah? um, which is trying to answer on the same level. But let's take a step back. 
And we have to realize we're dealing with a text. And it's the author of the text who is able to see this. It's because of what he wrote that we can see that the other Christians saw this. Yeah? So we're now thinking about the author of the letter. It is Irenaeus with his theological vision, his theological understanding, that can look at this spectacle, which is a catastrophe by any worldly standard, and he can see, because he knows the gospel, he can see the image of Christ in her. Yeah? So he's giving us a theological interpretation of what, what one could see physically. Is that clear? He's writing a verbal icon of her. Okay? Is that clear? Okay, let me ask the question again. Who sees her as an image of Christ? We do. Yeah, precisely. So now we're thinking on, on these different levels, what the text says. The fact that it's a text and is written by somebody who's writing this. And then the other fact is the reader. Yeah, the one to whom it's written. In this case, us. Yeah, so three different answers with regard to the same question. So we are the ones who, by virtue of Irenaeus's theological vision and penmanship, writing, we are the ones who are able to look at Blandina and see her as the image of Christ. Yeah? But in so far as it's a letter to people, then, then actually he's asking them to see it. Yes, it? absolutely. But it's the reader, you know, whether the reader's then or today. But now just think what's happened. Ha we said earlier, had we been there at the time with a video camera, yeah, sitting on, on the, with our iPhones taking selfies and, you know, videos of what's going on, what would we have seen? Had we been there at the time, what would we have seen? We would have seen a 14-year-old girl being ripped apart. 2,000 years later, we are not there, but 2,000 years later, by virtue of Irenaeus' writing and theological insight, we today can look at her and see the image of Christ in a way that had we been there, we would not have seen. Just think about the paradox of that. Yeah? In other words, time has completely collapsed. Yeah? This can, all of this is a warm-up exercise. Okay? I'm, I'm getting you thinking. It's a warm-up exercise. Okay. Um, and we just finish off with how it continues. Uh, so it carries on about Blandinus finally put to death and a young boy called Atalus. And then paragraph 45. Through there, Blandina and Atalus's continued life, the dead were made alive, and the martyrs showed favor to those who had failed to witness. And there was great joy for the virgin mother in receiving back alive those whom she had miscarried as dead. For through them, the majority of those who were denied were again brought to birth, and again conceived, and again brought to life, and learned to confess, and now living in strength, and they went to the judgment seat. Okay? So, again, it's another really dramatic passage. The dead were made alive. Who are the dead who were made alive? Yeah, it's specifically those who denied Christ. In other words, those who by earthly standards were alive. They were dead. And they are brought to life by going to their martyrdom. Yeah? In other words, death and life have been completely reversed. We are dead, the martyrs are living. Yeah? So they are kept alive by worldly standards, by backing out of their martyrdom, by, by sacrificing to the gods or swearing the oath, whatever they had to do. They're kept alive, but in fact, by doing that, they are stillborn children. They are dead infants of the Virgin Mother, the Virgin Mother who now brings them back to life as they, encouraged by Blandina's martyrdom, they are now willing to go back into the arena. Who's the Virgin Mother? I don't think so. The church. Primarily the church. And we'll come back to, if we've got time, we can go any number of directions with all of this, but we'll come back to why Virgin Mother, Church, 
um, later on. But here, it is definitely the church. It could perhaps be Blandina. She's acting as a mother towards all the others, encouraging them to go towards their martyrdom. But it's certainly the church. Yeah? So death and life are completely reversed. If you think about it, we come into the world with no freedom. Nobody asks me if I want to be born. Yeah, Kirill of Dostoevsky is a possess. We come to the world with no choice, and we're thrown into an existence in which whatever we do, we die. However good we make ourselves, however religious we become, whatever, we die. We're as good as dead from the moment we take our first breath. We are the dead, the martyrs of the living. It can be completely reversed. Yeah? In order to be... Um, in order to come into life, we have to be reborn through baptism, the Virgin Mother, the Church, and so on and so on. That's what this is already talking about. Okay, uh, one further quotation, number question number two. Sorry, Paul. Yeah. Talking about baptism, it's significant also, isn't it, that she puts on Christ. I can't remember where that was, but in the second quotation, the 41, 42, yeah. she put the on the invincible athlete. Woman that puts on the great yes, it's putting on. It's putting on. That's the same baptismal language. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, it's, a, it's a martyrdom, it's a, it's a baptism of martyrdom. Yeah? Um, we might get into this later, but both baptism and Eucharist really have their reality in our actual martyric death. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? Are you able to drink the cup I'm about to drink? This is her actually doing it. So that's Irenaeus, writing 177. Um, let's go back a few decades to St. Ignatius. Ignatius is on his way from Antioch to Rome to be martyred. He's walking with armed guard from Antioch to Rome. He meets various Christians. He writes to their communities. And then he sends a letter to the Christians in Rome. And in this letter to the Christians in Rome, basically he says, whatever you do, don't, don't try and stop me being martyred. Don't bribe the judges. Don't try and talk me out of it. Yeah? The quotation number two. He says, It's better for me to die in Christ Jesus than to be king over the ends of the earth. I seek him who died for our sake. I desire him who rose for us. Birth pangs are upon me. Suffer me, my brethren. That suffer as in, let me do this. You know, permit me. Suffer me, my brethren. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. Suffer me. Allow me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I shall be a human being. Suffer me to follow the example of the passion of my God. So he's taking the same language further. He's not yet born. Birth pangs are upon me. He's not yet living. Hinder me not from living. And he's not yet human. When I shall have arrived there, I shall become a human being. Yeah? And he's writing this, as I said, under guard as he's being walked from Antioch to Rome. He's not sitting in a library with all his books around him, working out some great big theological schema. This is simply falling from his pen. Okay? So with all of that in the background, let's just now turn to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then we can turn to the Gospel of John and explore what the Gospel of John has to tell us about all these different things. So, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What, what is the most striking thing about the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke? You know, we're so familiar with them that we tend to forget how strange they are when you actually think about it. Okay? For me, one of the most strange things about the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke is how slow the disciples are. I mean, slow is a polite word. I'd want to use something a bit stronger. How slow the disciples are. They're with Jesus for how long? Three years. They're walking around with him. They met his mother. They heard whatever his mother's got to say. They were up with him on the mountain as he gave the Sermon on the Mount. They saw him working miracles. They saw him doing all these different things. Do they understand who he is? <laughs> no. They really don't. They just do not. There's one passage before the Passion where one of the disciples makes a confession of faith. Do you remember where that is? Who that is? Peter, where? Yeah, where? Where? 
Yeah, where? Okay, no, that's good. You don't have to look, I'll tell you. Yes, but you're so wrong. <laughs> in the sense that, in the sense that if I go to, uh, again, this is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get you to think in a particular way. No, no, no. If I go to the road to Caesarea Philippi, will I find it? If I actually go to the road to Caesarea Philippi, will I find it? No, if I now go to the road to Caesarea Philippi, will I find it? No, I've got to go to Matthew 16 to find it. Yeah, I'm playing with you. Uh, but but, but with, a, with a point in mind, I'm trying to get you to think scripturally. The place you've, sorry, the place you've got to go to find this is Matthew 16. I want you to think scripturally, not geographically. Yeah? So certainly in Matthew 16 it says they're on the road to Caesarea Philippi. But to find it, I've got to go to Matthew 16. Don't, look at, don't, don't open your book. So tell me what happened, without looking at the book, tell me what happens in Matthew 16. Christ says, who do people say that I am? Some say you're the prophet, some say you're Elijah returns, some say you're the Baptist. And then he turns to Peter and he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And what does Peter say? You're, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. What does Christ say? That's why it's important to go to Matthew 16, because it's part of a dialogue. No, before that. Yeah, so Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. What does Christ say? No, before that. Without looking at the book. No, before that. What did you say? <laughs> you, 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 we get that. You, blessed are you, Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but it was made known to you by my Father. Yeah? And in fact, it's apocalypse. It's an apocalypse to you. It's revelation. Okay? Why is that important? That's the point. Seeing him, flesh and blood, six foot tall, five foot tall, two meters, one meter, whatever, 200 pounds, long hair, short hair, seeing him physically doesn't do it. It's got to be a revelation from the Father. Okay? Then what does he say? What does Christ say? Uh, well, first of all, he says, blessed, uh, he carries on Peter, um, you are the rock. On this rock I'll build my church. Whatever you bind, whatever you loose, the gates of hell will not prevail. Yeah? Then what does he say? He says, by the way, I've got to go to Jerusalem to suffer. What does Peter say? No. This, will ne this is not going to happen to you. And what does Christ say? Get behind me, Satan, the only disciple before the Passion who made the confession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and is then called the rock upon which you'll build the church, against which no one will prevail. Two verses later, it's called Satan. Yeah? Think about it. The only one to be called Satan is Peter. He doesn't say, Peter, stop listening to Satan, or Satan, get out of Peter, or something like that. Just, get behind me, Satan. Why is he calling Peter Satan? Flesh and blood, but specifically, specifically, what? From suffering. Try to, right, he's trying to get between Christ and the cross, yeah, to separate that. Yeah? So the one time when one of the disciples makes a confession of faith about who Christ is, he doesn't get it. Yeah? It's the exception which proves the rule. He still doesn't get it. Okay? So the disciples are with him all this time. They're seeing all that he does. They're hearing all that he does. All of it. They don't get it. What happens when he's crucified? What do the disciples do? Psh, run away. Yeah? And Peter denies him. I do not know the man. Three times. Yeah? What happens when they find the tomb empty? They don't believe in it, yeah? Um, the women come early in the morning with spices and they find the tomb empty. And what do they say? Do they say, oh, he must have risen? No, they say, what's happened? 
Has someone stolen the body? Yeah. Um, it takes an angel to explain to them. Don't you remember what he said that he would rise? Now go tell his disciples and so on. Yeah. What happens when they see the risen Christ? They don't recognize him. Just think about it. <coughs> Being with him for three years is not enough. Seeing him on the cross is not enough. Seeing the empty tomb is not enough. Seeing the risen Lord is not enough. Yeah? Every encounter with the risen Lord, something happens as a result of which they're able to recognize him. They don't recognize him immediately. Yeah? So seeing him on the cross, seeing the empty tomb, seeing the risen Lord is not enough to persuade them about who he is. It's really striking. Really striking. So let's take the example uh, Luke 24. The two disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus. Yeah? The risen Lord turns up. Don't, don't look at... The risen, I, want, I want you to know the scripture, not just to be able to move the page. The, the risen Christ turns up. How long has it been since they last saw him? Three days, yeah? Actually, it's the evening of the same day of the week. Um, and what do they say to him? What do they say to him? The risen Christ turns up. They're walking on the road to Emmaus. The risen Christ, two, a couple of days later, and they say, Don't Yeah, who are you? Are you a stranger? Haven't you heard what's been going on? You know, we were following this one called Jesus, and we thought he was going to save Israel, but he went and got himself killed, and then some of our company went to the tomb, and we found the tomb empty, and we've got no idea what's happening. Yeah? A point is being made in all of this. What happens next? What happens next? No, what happens next? There's no, no, no. You, you missed most. He opens the scripture, okay, and he shows what Moses and all the prophets spoke about how he had to suffer to enter into his glory. Okay, the book had to be opened. So he opens the scripture, shows how Moses and all the prophets spoke about how he had to enter his suffer to enter into his glory. The disciples' hearts start to burn. They persuade him to stay the night. Then what happens? He breaks the bread. Their eyes are open in the breaking of the bread. Then what happens? As soon as they recognize him, he disappears from sight. Okay. Why did we go through all of Blandina and everything with regard to that? And then through all of this, what have we learned from doing this? Two things. Who it is we are talking about and how we are talking about him. So the one that we confess is the crucified and risen Lord. Yeah? It's not by being with him before the passion. It's the crucified and risen Lord that we know. And how do the disciples know him to be the Son of God? How do they know this? No, you can be much more specific now. And opening the scripture and the breaking of the bread. Yeah? Now, why has it been important to establish that? That's what we do. Yeah? I went through all of this just to get to this point. We did all of Blandina just to get to this point. What do we do when we come to church? The scriptures are opened, yeah? And by the opening of scriptures, I mean not just, uh, obviously, reading, homilies, hymnography, the iconography. It's all opening of the scripture, the ritual, the movement, all of this. The church really is, when we come to church, we're not coming to a pile of bricks. We're coming to a space which is created, fabricated by the opening of the scripture. Yeah? It's like the matrix of the, of the scriptural typology and imagery and uh, all of it. It's a matrix. Yeah? Now, when I say the word matrix, I'm sure you're all thinking of the Hollywood films. Yeah? And you're thinking of all of that. But what does the word matrix mean? Classicists. Are there any classicists? It's a Latin word. 
it means womb. Matrix means womb. Yeah? So the church is our virgin mother, the womb, which is all of this opening of the scripture, this, this, uh, in, in the way we talk about it, the, the, the ritual, the iconography, the hymnography, the, the, the homilies, the readings, all of this is providing that space, which is a matrix in which we are born again in the virgin mother. Okay? All of that opening of the scripture culminates in the breaking of the bread. And what do we do when we break the bread? Again, yeah, no, I, I want a really simple answer. I, I, I think simply, down here. A really simple answer. What do we do when we break the bread? We eat it. Excellent, we eat it. Yeah? Literally, that's what we do. I want, you know, before you give me a big theological answer, just stay with what we actually do. We eat the bread. Yeah? We eat the body. And what do we become? Members of the body. We become the body of Christ. And that's why he disappears. If I'm his body, if we're his body, you can't see him somewhere else. Yeah? So, when we come to church, opening the scriptures and breaking the bread, um, we are literally on the road to Emmaus. Yeah, we are, that, that's how the road to Emmaus is defined, opening the scriptures and breaking the bread, which means we are not at a disadvantage for not having been there 2,000 years ago. Yeah, those who were there 2,000 years ago, did it help them? Seriously, did it help them? I always ask my students, if you had been in Jerusalem in the year 25 AD, having a cup of coffee at Starbucks, it was American, remember, and you saw them walking down the street, you saw Jesus walking down the street, would you have said, oh, there goes the word of God? Would you have said that? Sometimes students put their hand up and say, yeah, I would. They say, well, you must be demonically possessed. Yeah. Go and see the dean of students, because if you were a disciple, you wouldn't have done it. The disciples don't know by being around with him. Yeah. The way they come to know him is as a crucified and risen one who is encountered through the opening of the scripture and the breaking of the bread. Yeah? So there is no historical distance again, just like we saw with Blandina. That's why we did the whole thing with Blandina. We are the ones today looking at her as the image of Christ. We are the ones today who, in the opening of the scripture, the breaking of the bread, are doing exactly what the apostles did, meeting him on the, way to, on the road to Emmaus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, if it's Gospel of John, I, I, I'm, I'm preparing all of this to get to the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John is so different, yeah? But to understand how and why we needed to start with this. Okay, it's all background. Okay, but, but do stop me with other questions if, if you want. Um, is that clear then? Yeah? So from the beginning, we are concerned with the crucified and risen one who's known through the opening of Scripture and the breaking of the bread. One can do similar things with every other resurrectional account. Every other resurrectional account has got a point to tell us. Yeah? It's not just, you know, this is what happened. It's telling us something about how we encounter him. Okay? In the present. Okay? Now, the other thing which is really, really important to know um, about... Uh, I spoke about the crucified and risen one. This is the one we're concerned with. The other thing which is really important to know is the idea of the unity of the Paschal faith. Do you have the second sheet now? Can you just give, give it a okay. uh, I'm not going to talk to it just yet, but just, just so that when you come to it. Um, it's really, really striking. One of the things I learned while writing the book on the Gospel of John is that initially it is only the followers of John, Poly Polycarp, then Melito and others, only them who've got an annual celebration of Pascha at all. Okay. 
that the celebration of Pascha goes back to John very clearly. The only people in the second century who are celebrating it say that um, they are doing what John had instructed them to. Don't, don't try and look at the images, whatever, yet. Just wait, wait till I get there, okay? Otherwise, you, you won't follow what I'm saying. It, so the, the celebration of Pascha goes back to John. And interestingly, uh, that we got a letter from about 180, 189, by Polycrates of Ephesus, where he says that not only that John was the one that they're looking back to as the one who initiated this, but they also said in that letter that John wore the petalon in Jerusalem. The petalon is the, the gold leaf that the high priest in the temple wore. Yeah? It's the mark of the high priest in the Jerusalem temple. And according to them, John wore the petalon, the gold-plated the gold leaf. Okay? Nobody knows what to make of that. Some people say, well, if you look at the Gospel of John, um, John does have access to the, to the Temple Mount. He's able to get in, and Peter can get in with him. So he's got connections. Maybe he's from a priestly family. But to say he wore the petalon means he's the high priest. Yeah? Um, other people say it's just historical fantasy. Other people say, well, it must be historically true, and it's just been wiped out of memory by the Jews and whatever. So all of that. I think, however, all of that's missing the point, because what in the Gospel of John is the temple? What is the temple in the Gospel of John? And you're told that in the opening chapters. His own body, yeah? In, the opening, in chapter 2, chapter 3, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. He was speaking about the temple of his body. Yeah? So Christ himself is the temple. In the Gospel of John, we have John standing by the cross. In the other Gospels, all the disciples have abandoned him. In John, he's standing by the cross. So you can really say, John is the high priest of the Paschal mystery. Yeah, he's one, he, literally the one who initiated, the one who's there officiating, if you like, at the Paschal mystery where the Christ is the temple. Yeah? And we'll come back to other aspects of that in a minute. It is really striking how... Johannine, our celebration of Pascha is. It's, even if the developments of the 4th, 5th century onwards, where you start to get all the liturgical developments, it is thoroughly Johannine. Um, yeah, so we read the prologue of the Gospel of John on Easter night. Yeah, and we read the Gospel of John thereafter in Pascha time. Holy Thursday in the Orthodox tradition is what? Does it commemorate the Last Supper? Holy Thursday. Does it commemorate the Last Supper? No. What's the hymnography? Uh, the anointment's a later thing. No, the, all, the, all the, the hymnography is about the washing of feet. Yeah, it's the washing of feet that is primarily being done here, yeah? Um, which is only in John. Yeah? Lazarus Saturday, only in John. Thomas Sunday, only in John. John's got his thumbprint all over Pascha, yeah? even as it develops centuries later. So the celebration of Pascha comes out of the Johannine tradition. Initially, it is celebrated as a single-day event on the 14th of Nisan. Single-day event. Later, by the end of the second century, it becomes a three-day event the three-day Pascha, the tridium, yeah? the triumeros Pascha. Then by the fourth century, it becomes a whole week celebration. Yeah? You can only do that after Constantine, when you've got a Christianized city. You can go here for Palm Sunday, here for the washing of the feet, here for the crucifixion. You've got a whole liturgy of space and time. Okay? Now, the image I would like to use for that is the image of Pascha as a pure white light, which you can put through a prism and get a spectrum of colors, like a rainbow. Yeah? And that's great because you can appreciate each color, yeah? and it's richer. But you have to remember the colors hold together. Otherwise, it falls apart. Okay? So now, we've inherited, over the last 1,500 years, 
we celebrate the crucifixion on one day, then the burial, and then the resurrection. Yeah? But even when we split it up like that, it's still a singular event. Just think about it. We spend, what, 40 days preparing for Pascha, three weeks before Lent preparing for Lent, 40 days after Pascha learning how to receive Pascha. We spend about half the year either preparing for Pascha or receiving Pascha. Yeah? So the church is telling us this is important. And for 40 days we sing the hymn, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. Yeah? We sing it how many times during Pascha tide? <laughs> Thousands of times. Yeah? The church is really trying to drum it into us. Um, but the trouble is, the more we do something, the less we pay attention to it. Yeah? So Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. How does he conquer death? By death. Yeah? It's not he dies on one day because he's human, but because he's God, later on he can get himself out of the grave. That would be great for him, but it wouldn't help anybody. Yeah? Rather, he tramples down death by death, because what do we all have in common from the beginning of the world onwards? Death, that we're going to die. So what he does is to change, as Maximus puts it, change the use of death, so that what was once the end now becomes the beginning. Yeah? The martyrs are born into life through their martyrdom, through their voluntary death. How do we go from Adam to Christ? By when we, when, we, when we move from Adam to Christ, from how we came into this world to becoming a Christian, what's the mark, that, the step that we take? Baptism. I, I, I'm not asking difficult questions. Baptism. Baptism is what? It's, it's a sacramental death. We, we're going to die to ourselves in, in Adam. We're going to rise with Christ. Yeah? We, we, we make that transition through death. So death was once the end. It's now become the beginning. Trampling down death by death. If you lose the singularity of that, the way it holds together, it falls apart. So one can really say, Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way that he dies as a human being. Yeah? I would write that down. Christ shows, and every word is loaded there. Christ. And by Christ, I mean the crucified and risen one. This one shows us what it is to be God. This is not a divine action which God can do something different. This is what it is to be God. That's the point of Nicaea and Constantinople. Homoousios. This is what it is to be God. Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way in which he dies as a human being. Not simply by dying, the way he dies. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Yeah? He shows what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being. So it's not he shows us what it is to be God on the one hand, and on the other hand he shows us what it is to be human as two distinct faces, if you like, but one and the same. One hypostasis, one prosopon, one reality. That's the whole point of Chalcedon. Okay? We've got one image of the invisible God. He shows us what it is to be God in the way in which he dies as a human being. Now, interestingly, this idea of the single paschal light being refracted into a spectrum of colors, we can see that um, iconographically. If you look at the images, the top are the first images we have, the top three, are the first images we have of the, of the crucifixion. Okay? All from the 5th, 6th century. Images of the crucifixion. Okay? Um, what's striking about them is that all of them, Christ has his arms straight and his eyes wide open. Okay? Now, if you, re if you read art historians, they will say it's because 
Christians were ashamed to depict a dead Christ on the cross. That's simply not true. The point is here, we've got the living one upon the cross. Yeah? He's, he's, he's straight, he's right, and his eyes are wide open. He's living. Okay? So this is the living one. Just like Ignatius would become living through his martyrdom. Okay? Eventually, by about the, uh, a century or two later, you start to get an image of the dead Christ on the cross and simultaneously an image of the resurrection. What's the image of the dead Christ on the cross? How does he look? No, no, the dead Christ on the cross. No, 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 the dead Christ. No, he is actually slouched. Yeah, he, he's covered. If you look at Father, if you hold your cross for a minute. Um, unlike the earliest... This is early. Yeah. Uh, two, two or three centuries later, you start to get... So initially, you've got one image of the living one on the cross, and it, it, uh, it, it uh, refracts, it bipartites, yeah, into a dead Christ and the anastasis. Sim simultaneously, actually. Okay? Um, once you start to get an image of the dead Christ on the cross, how is he depicted? He's depicted slouched. Yeah? That goes back to... Um, Christ's words in the Gospel of John. Just as Moses lifted up the bronze snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Where does that refer back to? No. Pardon? Numbers. Numbers 21. Okay. What happened in Numbers 21? The people of Israel had come out of Egypt. They're wandering through the desert. And what are they doing? No, no, before the snakes, what are they doing? Complaining. They're complaining. Literally, they're complaining. They're complaining. They're saying, this is foolishness to be in the desert. Let's go back to Egypt. Yes, we were slaves, but we had food and clothes and housing. Yeah, we're going to die here. It's foolishness. God then punished them with serpents, snakes. Why snakes? Why snakes? No. No. What was the, what, it goes back to that, but what was the problem with the Israelites? What were they doing? What was their sin? No, what was their sin? They were complaining. They were murmuring. It was the tongue that was the problem. Yeah? They're using their tongue against God, so God punishes them with poisonous tongues. Yeah? So it's with back and forth like that, yeah? And at the same time as he punishes them with poisonous tongues, he provides a remedy of a snake lifted up upon the pole. So when they lift up the snake on the pole, they look at, at the snake, they regain life. Yeah? Okay. Um, what does the image of a snake on the pole go back to? Or snake on a piece of wood, what does that go back to? You said it earlier. The Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. You've got a snake on the tree. Yeah? So in the Garden of Eden, you've got a snake on a tree who's promising life, but unable to give it. Christ is our snake on the tree, giving us life. He's depicted like a snake when he's, when he's dead, yeah? So all, all of this imagery go, p piles on upon itself, yeah? Um, there's another image of a snake on a pole. And this is really striking. Really striking. It's an Asclepius. Asclepius. You know, we tend to think that the proclamation of the crucifixion is distinctively Christian, and indeed it is, but it's drawing upon an image which was known to everybody in the ancient world. The image of a, of a snake and a pole is a sign of the doctor. Asclepius. Asclepius. Yeah? And even today on a barber, uh, uh, the, the, the barbers, you've got the, the red and white pole going around outside a barber. I've seen it walking around Tallinn. Oh, apothec, okay. In, 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 in England... You have the snake on the okay, you have a snake on the apothec, but on the barber's shop, and I've seen this in, in Thailand, you've got a white pole with a red s spiral going around it, yeah? That's, again, this is a symbol of Asclepius, because the barbers were the blood letters, the doctors of a few centuries ago. Yeah, it's the doctors, yeah? So, so you've got all this imagery piling on itself. Okay? So initially, the images of the living Christ on the cross, arms straight, eyes wide open, then you start to get an image of the dead Christ on the cross. 
When you start to get the image of the dead Christ on the cross, you also have an image of the anastasis. Okay, we should, you, know, you all know the image of that. But look at that image. Art historians tend to call it the harrowing of hell. You know, emptying hell of all the people, yeah? But that's not correct. Because every image like this is always called anastasis. Okay? So why are they tempted to say, no, it's not the anastasis, it's the, the raising of the, the harrowing of hell? Who's being raised in this image? Adam and Eve, not Christ. Yeah? And in fact, what position is Christ in? He's still actually in the image of the crucified one. He's got his arms outstretched, pulling up Adam and Eve, and he's on the, on the gates of hell placed as a cross. So again, it's the image of the crucified one seen in different aspects now, dead and victorious. What was held together as one image is, held, is now refracted, but it's the same image. Is that clear? Okay, so you, it's not clear? Oh, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not, yeah, the lowest one. It's not an image of Christ getting out of the tomb. It's an image of him lifting up Adam and Eve, the whole of humanity. Yes? Yeah? And he is actually still in the form of a crucified one. He's got his arms outstretched, lifting up with his arms. And he's standing on the gates of hell, which are positioned like a cross. Okay? Okay. Um, so, having gone through... Uh, Landina and then through Matthew, Mark and Luke the importance of the one we are talking about is the crucified and risen one the unity of the paschal event this one who is known by the opening of the scriptures and the breaking of the bread okay this is the base of our faith but I'm, I'm just talking about you know, basic theology the opening of the scriptures let's just say a quick word about that when I say scripture there what do I mean? What books am I talking about? When we say in the creed, like we did a couple of hours ago, Christ died and rose in accordance with the scripture. Old Testament, Old Testament. prophecies, numbers, Exodus, Genesis, Psalms, whatever it might, Isaiah, all of this, yeah? So the primary textual material for encountering Christ is what? The primary texts for knowing Christ is what? Pardon? Old Testament. Old Testament. Not Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. The primary texts for knowing Christ are the scriptures. I tried to get my students to stop using the term Old Testament. Yeah? When we, we call it Old Testament because we've now got all the books printed in one, bound in a Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and we think the Old Testament is about the history leading up to Jesus. And if you want to know about Jesus, you read the Gospels. Yeah? But the reason I've spent so long on this, because the disciples themselves, the apostles and the evangelists, they only know him through the opening of the Scriptures. And if they call that Scripture, that's a good enough name for me. Yeah? I'm not going to call it Old Testament. I'm going to call it Scripture. And if you want to know about Christ, those are the books you turn to. Not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, you turn to them as well, obviously you do. But they are, they're, they're strictly secondary because they are always presenting themselves vis-a-vis -vis the Scripture. Yeah? The Gospel of Mark, the first Gospel people say to be written. How does the Gospel of Mark start? The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ and, no, that's Matthew and Luke. The Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, as it says in Isaiah. Behold, I send one to prepare... You know, the, you're, you're taken straight back to Isaiah to understand this. Yeah? In Matthew and Luke, this is done that this might be fulfilled. All the way through. Yeah? So it's always referring back to these texts. You've got to know these texts. Okay? Now... Uh, there's, Name, name me some texts from the scriptures which would be important for understanding uh, Jesus Christ and his passion. 
Go on, get your mind thinking. Jonah. The three, three in the, the, three yeah, the, the, the text we hear all the time, yeah? Um, uh, Abraham and Isaac, Jonah. Yeah, all, all these texts. Uh, the, the Passover lamb, the lamb being slain at Passover in Exodus, all these kind of things, yeah? Joseph. I mean, all, all of these things. Yeah? So, they are the, well, so when you hear them in church, especially during Holy Week, on Holy Saturday, 15 Old Testament readings, don't hear them as these are things about something in the past which, you know, we're reading because whatever. No, they're the texts telling us about who Christ is. What would be the most important text? Really, the most important text. Isaiah, Isaiah what? <laughs> Isaiah 53. Uh, actually starts with Isaiah 52, 13, all the way through 53. You all know this passage. I'm not going to read it's not I'm, I'm not going to read it all, but you all know it. Behold, my servant shall prosper, shall be exalted and lifted up. Many shall be very high. As many were astonished at him, his appearance was so mild beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of the sons of men. Um, he was oppressed. Uh, he's borne our grief. He's carried our sorrows. We, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that made us whole. By his streets we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. And so on. You all know the passage, I'm sure. You should do. Yeah, we use it in, in Proscomedi. Yeah? Isaiah 53. Um, when, okay, when do we say that liturgically? There's only one time in the year when we read that reading. Isaiah 53. Go on, Great Vespers when? No, not, day, you're a day out. <laughs> Holy Friday. Holy Friday. Um, on Holy Friday matins, on Thursday evening, we read all the Passion Gospels. Holy Friday Vespers, we start off with the body of Christ on the altar. Um, we celebrate Vespers. And then we read, the only time in the year, we read Isaiah 53. Okay? And as we take the body of Christ down and we bury him. Okay? Now, what is really striking about the way we read Isaiah 53? We still haven't got to the Gospel of John, but I'm going to get there in just a minute. Okay? Isaiah 53. What? Yeah, but the, no, about uh, how, how we read Isaiah 53 in particular. There's something really striking about it. Okay. If you read any modern Bible, it will tell you that the fourth hymn of the suffering servant is Isaiah 52.13 to 53.12. Okay. Mm, not, not quite. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Uh, that every modern Bible says that's the fourth hymn of the suffering servant, and what follows is a different oracle altogether. But when we read it, we read Isaiah 54 1 as well. So we read the whole hymn of the suffering servant, and then we read Isaiah 54 1. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in travail. For the children of the desolate one, will be more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. But isn't that striking? We re at the moment we place the body of Christ in the tomb, we read the, the most important hymn, passage, lengthy passage from the Old Testament, speaking about the passion of Christ, and it culminates with the barren one giving birth to many children. Yeah? This takes us back to the virgin mother that we saw earlier. The church is the virgin mother who, as a result of the passion of Christ, gives birth to many children. Does that make sense? Because after all, how do we go from being children of Adam to children of God? Well, no, well b sorry, before that, by baptism. 
so be, yeah, before coming to communion, by, by baptism, we, 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 we die to Adam, we are reborn in baptism. Yeah? And baptism is specifically baptism into the death of Christ, to be reborn with him. So the passion of Christ is the catalyst which enables the, the barren woman to become the virgin mother giving birth to many children. Yeah, you follow that? Yes? Okay, and now we can go to one further level of refracting the paschal light. We spoke about the paschal light through a prism to get many colors. Um, why do we celebrate the nativity, the birth of Christ on the 25th of December? Nine months after. <laughs> okay, that his, but it, it, it's, it's important to understand how this unfolds historically. Initially, you have the celebration of Pascha on the 14th of Nisan, yeah, of Nisan, the Jewish month. The 14th of Nisan in the Roman calendar would be the 25th of March. Before you, get, before you think about Annunciation, it's the date of the Passion. So you go from the Passion, nine months later you have the birth, which is his birth and our birth in him and his birth in us. Yeah? Think about the, the icon of the Nativity. Can you, can you all imagine the icon of the Nativity? Yeah? It's not on... Well, now, the icon of the nativity, what does it depict? Does it depict what you read about in Matthew and Luke? No, it doesn't. In the icon of the nativity, Christ already has a cross in his halo. Yeah? Because we only know him as a crucified one. We did all that earlier, okay? We know him as a crucified one. Um, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. Like what? Like a corpse. He's placed in a manger. What do you put in a manger? A, a, a food. Food. What do we do? We eat his body. Bethlehem means what? House of bread. House of bread, yeah. Um, the manger is shaped either like a coffin or like an altar. The same point is clearly there, yeah? And the, the manger is placed in a cave. Why in a cave? So if you think about the icon, you've got the virgin lying like that and the cave like that. It's one shape. So what is special about the cave in which the dead Christ is placed? There are two things. There are two things which are said in the Gospel and they are said in the hymnography as we take his body down from the tree and place it in the tomb. There are two things said about the tomb. Whose tomb is it? Joseph. Joseph. And what's special about the tomb? Newly hewn. No man had ever been laid in it. So you've got Joseph and a virgin tomb, and now you have Joseph and a virgin womb. Yeah? So the way we talk about his birth is an aspect of how we talk about his passion. Yeah, it's coming out of that and it's now our birth in him and so on. So let's turn to the Gospel of John. If you remember earlier I said Christ showed us what it is to be God by the way in which he dies as a human. Not simply by dying but the way in which he dies. And we understand, you know, when we saw him dying on the cross the disciples ran in fear. They didn't get it. When they go back to Isaiah they can say, he wasn't put to death, he voluntarily gave himself up. Yeah? There's a line in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, which the priest reads. The priest, during the anaphora, the priest says, in the night in which he was given up, or rather, gave himself up for the life of the world. Yeah? And that line used to really bother me. I used to think, St. John, which one do you mean? Yeah? If you mean this, then just cut out the first one. Yeah? But it's important. 
in the night in which he was given up, or rather gave himself up, if we'd been there with a video camera, we could have seen him being put to death. Yeah? That's all you could take with a video camera, him being put to death. And we, like the disciples, we would have run in fear. Okay? So how do we go from being put to death to no rather gave himself up? How do we go from one level to the other? By the opening of the scripture, yeah? By going back to Isaiah, by going back to Exodus, and all of these passages, okay? It, you could put it this way. Uh, it's the difference between history and theology. In the night in which he was given up, that's what you can see. Or rather, gave himself up. That's what we can understand when the scriptures are opened. Yeah? We're talking about the same thing, but we're talking about it in two different ways. Does that make sense? Yeah? Now, the reason why that's important to have got to this is because that's where the Gospel of John starts. The Gospel of John starts where the other Gospels finish. The other gospel, and, I, and I don't mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, oh, here's John. I don't mean that. I mean, the other Gospels, only at the end of the other Gospels are the Scriptures opened and the disciples know. But that's known at the beginning of the Gospel of John. You've got Philip telling Nathaniel, we found the one of whom Moses speaks, already in chapter 1. Yeah? You've got John the Baptist seeing Christ come to him. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God. Why does he say that? Is it because he sees a fluffy white animal walking towards him? He's referring back to Isaiah or Exodus, yeah? He's already interpreting him in terms of scripture. Um, uh, Philip tells Nathaniel, we found the one of whom Moses speaks. Uh, king, rabbi, lord, king of Israel. And Christ says, that's not enough. You think that's great? You're going to see greater things than this. You're going to see the heavens opened and the angels ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. What does that refer to, do you think? Uh, definitely back to Jacob. Yeah, yeah. But what's really interesting, so uh, Christ is now, in, in Jacob, it refers back to Genesis 28, Jacob, where uh, the, the ladder goes from earth to heaven. Christ is now the one who mediates between earth and heaven, bridges both together as a son of man. Yeah? But what's really interesting is the angels ascend and descend. Surely they should descend and ascend. Surely they start off in heaven, come down and go back up. Yeah? But everywhere in scripture it is ascend and descend. Okay. We can come back to that if you like, but let's just carry on just looking at John more generally. So John starts off with the scriptures opened already. Okay. And then the Gospel of John is so different thereafter. Um, in the Gospel of John, Christ is always saying things like, I am from above, you are from below. I'm sent from the Father, you are children of the earth. Yeah? In the Gospel of John, there is no transfiguration. Why not? Is it because he forgot to include it? Or is it because Christ is transfigured on every page in the Gospel of John? On every page you see him as the divine Lord. Yeah? On every page he's the one who's in control, doing the Father's will, knowing what he's about. Yeah? And he's not going to be rushed. It's not time yet. When I'm ready, it'll be time. Yeah? When it comes to Gethsemane, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Christ is sweating tears of blood, saying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. What does he do in the Gospel of John? Does he look like he's in trouble? Does he look like he's in anguish? He says, now my soul is troubled. Do you remember the, the reading on Holy Thursday, the first Gospel reading on the Passion Gospels? Yeah? Do you remember that? Do you, do you remember <laughs> the long one? Do you remember, yeah, what, 40 minutes or something? It's really long, yeah? And in all of that, does it sound like he's troubled or in anguish? 
very clear. Father, glorify me with the glory I had from all eternity. You gave them to me. I've kept them in your name. Let them be one like we are one. All of that, yeah? He's not in trouble like the other Gospels, okay? And in, in fact, he says, in the Gospel of uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. In the Gospel of John, he says what? He says, what? Should I say, let this cup pass? No, for this reason I've come. Yeah, it's completely different because we're seeing the scriptural Lord throughout. John starts off where the other ones finish. Okay. In the Gospel of John, he's crucified on a different day. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the lambs are slain in the temple, they have the meal, and Christ is crucified the following day. In the Gospel of John, he's crucified when the lambs are slain. Why? He's the lamb. Yeah? It's, not a, it's not a question of accurate chronology or you know, it is making a point. From the beginning of the gospel, you've been told, he's the Lamb of God. Yeah? John the Baptist. Well, if he's the Lamb of God, when's he going to be crucified? When the lambs are slain. It's a theological point. Okay? In the gospel of John, um, Christ ascends in glory on the cross. When I'm lifted up, then you will know I am. When I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. You've actually got ascension in glory on the cross. Okay? In fact, you've also got Pentecost on the cross. From the cross, Christ breathed the Spirit and says, uh, receive the, uh, he, he hands over the Spirit. He hands over the Spirit. We can look more at that if we have time. Um, yeah, so you, you've got... You've got uh, Ascension in glory, the breathing of the Spirit, all held together in this single paschal event of the Passion, the Pathos. Okay? And then from the cross, Christ says completely different words. He doesn't say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, um, I thirst, so that scripture might be fulfilled. He says words to the woman at the foot of the cross. I'm going to come back to that later because I want to treat one thing before that, and then he says, it's finished, to tell his day. Okay, what is finished in the Gospel of John, when Christ is on the cross? What is finished? We, we, we tend to hear it as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He breathes his last, it's come to an end, it's over. But the word to tell his day means uh, more than that, it's perfected, it's completed, it's fulfilled, it's brought to completion, perfection, yeah? So what is brought to completion? God's plan. Which is what? Which is salvation. Now you've already differentiated. We, we, we tend to think creation, fall, salvation, plan A, plan B. Yeah, Christ is not plan B, yeah? Andrew. Yeah, he's, 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 he's plagiarizing. <laughs> but uh, the gospel, it's, it's been built more concrete. It's certainly the plan of God, the purpose of God. But what is the purpose of God? We tend to speak about it too easily. But in fact, scripturally, there's one thing, only one thing. Now, the gospel of John is playing on Genesis. Yeah, it tells you that from the open. Uh, the gospel of John is playing upon Genesis. It tells you from the opening word, in the beginning, in the beginning. Yeah? The Gospel of John is deliberately echoing Genesis. So you tell me, what happens in Genesis? No, what, no, no, what happens in Genesis? Just tell me, what happens in Genesis 1? Creation. How? 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 Just tell me, tell me what, what does God do? God speaks. God speaks everything into existence. He says, let there be. Let there be light. Let there be a firmament. Let the waters be gathered. Let there be plants. Let the plants put forth. Let the animals come forth. Let there be. Let there be. Let there be. It is. It's good. It's done. Next day. He speaks everything into existence. Then what does he do? And what's different about that? Okay. We always tend, we always, I'm, I'm, yeah, we always tend to think 
that the, the difference lies in the us. Let us do this, yeah? And then we say, well, there's a trinity. Okay, that's, that's, that's not sufficient. Our Trinitarian faith does not depend upon the plural pronoun. Our Trinitarian faith depends upon our confession that Christ is the Son of God. Okay, but that's not the most striking part. It's not the plural that's the striking part. There's something even more striking. No, that's Genesis 2. No, 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 no. It's made. But, but just a bit more precise. No, no. Think grammatically. No. It's not an imperative. It's a subjunctive. Everything else is, let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. Is done good. He speaks it all into existence. Yeah? It's almost like he, he's setting up the stage yeah? for his work. He's setting up the stage. And having set up the stage, he says, okay, let us make. It's a project. Literally, it's a project. This is, this is the only thing he deliberates about. It's the only thing which is said to be his work, deliberately his work. It's the only thing he's planning, conceiving, and it's, it's given in a subjunctive. Yeah? It's a project. I would strongly argue, and I have argued in the book, and uh, the book I finished writing, but I've done it before that, that the particular project of God is to make a human being in his image, okay? That that is what is complete when Christ is on the cross. Because what does Pilate say? Only in the Gospel of John, just before Christ goes to the cross. Ecce homo, behold the human being, idu or anthropos. So you've got scripture starting off by saying, let us make a human being, and it concludes, behold the human being. Yeah? And that's why Ignatius can say, let me go to my martyrdom, because when I go to my martyrdom, I will be a human being. Remember that? Okay. So, what's really striking then is the only thing that is said to be God's own work, who says, let it be? God says, let it be, let it be, let it be. Everything's spoken into existence. For his project, who says, let it be? Christ, Mary, and each of us. Ignatius has to say, let it be, let me go to my martyrdom. Yeah? Um, remember I said earlier that Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being. We can now also say Christ shows us what it is to be human in the way he dies as a human being. So to be human in that sense, in that fullest sense that Christ shows us, Christ defines for us what it is to be God, and he defines for us what it is to be human. To be human is to live by voluntarily taking up the cross, not living for yourself, but living for others. Does that make sense? So, as I put it earlier when we were talking about the martyrs, We've come into existence with no choice. Nobody asked me if I want to be born. Here I am. I've been thrown into a world, a world in which whatever I do, I will die. It sucks. Yeah, it sucks. But what Christ has done is to turn all of that inside out and to show us how that mortality can actually be used voluntarily in love to make ourselves human beings, yeah? ones who live by voluntary self-sacrificial love. So we've got a choice. In Adam, we live by necessity and mortality. That's the, ex that's the ground of our existence, necessity and mortality. What we can do in Christ by following Christ is to make freedom and self-sacrificial love the basis of our existence. Yeah. But if freedom and self-sacrificial love is the base of our existence, well, that actually is what it is to be God. Freedom and self-sacrificial love. So we are invited to say, let it be. So when God says, let us make a human being, 
we're the ones he's addressing. We're the ones who've got to say, let it be. Yeah? You can't create a being who lives by voluntary self-sacrificial love. You can't, because it wouldn't be voluntary. But you can create a being who can respond to that and say, let it be. And so, in fact, we can see the whole of our existence as being one pedagogy leading us to be able to say, let it be, so that we too become human. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just, just want to uh, make it clear for myself. Uh, so, uh, it, it seems uh, couldn't make Adam as a human because... Uh, uh, well, if to be human is as Christ defines it, remember, we, we tend to think, we, we tend to think, this is the way we tend to do theology, we tend to think we know what God is and we know what human beings are, and Christ has brought them together. Yeah? After all, aren't we already human? Don't we know what God is? And we tend to think God is a projection. But we should do it the other way around. We should do it the other way around. Christ defines for us what it is to be God and what it is to be human. Yeah? So if we're going to take Christ's standard of what it is to be human, it is to live a life of voluntary, self-sacrificial love. Yeah? He laid down his life for us. Yeah? And because he laid down his life for us, the Father loves him, he says in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, I think. Yeah? God loved the world this way he gave his son for us. Okay? In the Gospel of John, the passion of Christ is never described in terms of atonement for sin. It's always an expression of love coming out of God himself. Okay? This is an expression of love. Um, so Christ show, defines for us what it is to be human. To live like that is what it is to be human. And that's something we have to work towards. Yeah? Does that help answer your question? Be before sin, wasn't Adam human according to the, the We've got to be really careful when we talk about before the fall and after the fall. When was the fall? When was it? Probably when he ate. Yeah, was, was, it a was it a Tuesday, a Wednesday? Was it, was it, what year was it? Was it 4,000 BC, 10,000 BC? Where, where, <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing you because I want you to be very specific about what you think. Yeah? Another way of putting this, when Paul, before he encountered Christ, did Paul think he needed salvation? Did Paul think he was a sinner needing to be saved? No. He said, I was zealous, I, was, I kept the law blamelessly, and so blamelessly I was persecuting the Christians because you've got it wrong. Yeah? He then encounters Christ, and then he understands, if this is the saviour, the conclusion is, I need to be saved. Yeah? The solution comes first, then we work out the problem. Okay? So what we tend to do, creation... We messed it up. God has to work salvation through Christ. Yeah? But that makes Christ a response to our failure. That makes Christ plan B. Christ is not plan B. Yeah? The example of Paul points out that we only know ourselves to be sinful after we encounter Christ. The solution comes first, then we understand. So now, in the light of Christ, we can say, Adam sinned, death came into the world, Christ was righteous, life came into the world. But we can also say what Paul says, that God has consigned all to sin so that he may have mercy upon all. Yeah? So in fact, our life now becomes one whole life of pedagogy culminating in our actual death. Yeah? So whether we get it or not, we are going to die and we're going to become clay in his hands. Okay, so the whole, the whole life is one of pay to go. So don't think about it in terms of plan A, plan B. Paul says, Adam is a type of the one to come. 
Typos to melondos, Romans 5.14, a type of the one to come. There never was a moment when Adam was not always referring to Christ. Yeah? A type, a sketch, a preliminary model yeah, of the fullness that is to come. Um, here. Yeah, if you look at the bottom of page two, quotation number 12. This is Nicholas Cabasilus writing at the end of the 14th century. It was for the new human being that human nature was created at the beginning. For him, mind and desire was prepared. It was not the old Adam who was a model for the new, but the new Adam was a model for the old. Because of its nature, the old Adam might be considered to be the archetype to those who see him first. But for him who sees everything before his eyes, the older is the imitation of the second. Ad Christ is first, Adam is second. Yeah. yeah? Um, so when Paul says Adam's a type of the one to come, do you know what the word type means and where it comes from? Okay, the word type, typos, it comes from the Greek word tipto, meaning to hit. So if you've got a seal and wax, yeah, you, you hit the, the wax with the seal and you create an imprint, a type. Okay? So Adam's a type of the one to come. The reality is Christ. Adam's a preliminary sketch. Yeah? But the reality must exist before the imprint. Otherwise, there couldn't be an imprint. Does that make sense? Okay. So likewise, um, in all of this, it is, um, it's a matter of pedagogy. Just like with a newborn child. A new, would you say a newborn child is human? <laughs> yes, ob obviously we do. We call ourselves human. Um, but if part of what it is to be human is to be able to walk and talk, can a newborn child do that? Well, so it comes down to the divinity. It comes, yeah, but if part of what it is to be human, if part of what it is to be human is to be able to walk and talk, can a newborn infant do that? No. Is it because the legs are imperfect? No, it's because they're unexercised. Yeah. Yeah? You need pedagogy, you need exercise. And part of the exercise is falling down and coming up again. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So if, part of, if the, your definition of human is to be able to walk and talk, a newborn child has to grow up into that. If your definition of human is not to live for yourself, but to live for your neighbor, for the kingdom, for Christ, and so on. Again, you've got to grow up to that. You need pedagogy to learn how to love. Okay. I can carry on forever. <laughs> we can enjoy. We've got some questions for um, this, this whole idea of... It seems we, we're, we're talking about the Holy Week services. Look at quotation number 11. This is... Said, it says this very concretely here. Um, so this is, we, we spoke about reading the Gospels before the cross, the burial of Christ in the tomb, Isaiah 53. With Christ in the tomb on Holy Saturday, we sing, Moses the Great mystically prefigured this present day, saying, God blessed the seventh day. For this is the blessed Sabbath. This is the day of rest on which the only begotten Son of God rested from all his works. Through the economy of death, he kept the Sabbath in the flesh, and returning again through the resurrection, he's granted us eternal life, for he alone is good and loves humankind. Notice how it says, with Christ in the tomb, we are saying this is the blessed Sabbath. We're not saying this is like the blessed Sabbath. Yeah? It's not, God created everything and took a rest way back then, and now Christ is taking a rest. Yeah? Now we're reading Genesis as speaking about Christ. This is the blessed Sabbath. Creation is complete. This is the fulfillment of all his work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how long can I actually go for? Oh, you. you yeah. Okay, let, let me just say something. Um, there, there are two more things I, w I want to talk about, although one of them involves four points, but never mind. Two more things. Um, we spoke about the opening of the Scripture, and the Scripture clearly is the Old Testament, the Law, the Psalms, and the Prophets. 
this has got really significant implications for how we read scripture. Okay? As I said, we, we tend to read it as the Old Testament, the history about what happened prior to Christ. No, we read it as speaking about him. Okay? There are four points regarding scripture to read a text of scripture in antiquity. There are four points. Okay? What makes it scripture? You know, how are you reading a text that you're not reading it like a history book or like a, a mythological book, but you're reading it as scripture? Four things. Firstly, it's cryptic. Yeah? It's not clear what it says. You know, the disciples, Paul, they've been reading scripture all their life, but they didn't get it. Only now in the light of Christ to say, oh, now I get what Isaiah's talking about, yeah? So it wasn't clear to begin with. It's got, the veil has got to be lifted. The book has got to be open. It's cryptic. The second point is it's harmonious. Moses and all the prophets spoke about how he had to suffer. This is what they are writing about. They're writing about it under all sorts of different images. Exodus from Egypt, the bronze snake in the wilderness, all these different are, are ways of talking about Christ. Yeah? So it's cryptic. It's harmonious. The third point is it's contemporary. In the Gospel of John, Christ says, if you believe Moses, you will believe me because Moses, what? Moses wrote about me, not Moses wrote about things that happened 10,000 years ago, yeah? So when you're talking about, you know, the fall of history and that kind of thing, you're misreading scripture in that way. You're not reading it about the past. If you can read it about the past, but if you're reading it as a history book about the past, you are not reading it as scripture. Does that make, is that clear, yeah? Cryptic, harmonious, contemporary, and therefore, fourthly, inspired. And I said that deliberately, fourthly. We tend to think the primary difference between this book and another book is that this is inspired and that one isn't. Yeah? And then we think it's inspired however we read it. We tend to think of inspiration in very kind of discrete terms. Isaiah was inspired in the temple in the 6th century BC and he wrote down what he saw and inspired and so on. Well, I don't know about you, but I've got no idea what was in Isaiah's mind when he wrote his book. But I know for a fact that nobody was reading Isaiah as speaking about a crucified Messiah born of a virgin until after the event. No doubt about it. Yeah? which means you cannot separate the inspiration of Isaiah from the opening of the book by Christ. There's no way of speaking about the inspiration apart from when Christ opens the books to say, hey, look, it's talking about me. Yeah? Um, which means you also have to say the inspired reader. So the inspiration of the book is Christ opening the book to show how the inspired author is speaking about him to an inspired reader, one and the same act of inspiration turning upon Christ. Does that make sense? In a sense, that's, that's treating it in a hermeneutical key rather than a historical key. Okay? Um, I mentioned the, the words of Christ from the cross. The one we didn't treat was, uh, if you go back to the bottom of page one, Station number three. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother, it's very interesting how the, the prepositions change, and usually translations miss it. So when, when, it's when, when it's taking the narrator's point of view, when Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, actually, uh, it should simply be the mother there, um, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. 
From that hour, the disciple took his, her to his home. So who is this woman standing at the foot of the cross? Okay, we immediately think Mary. Of course, we think Mary, John, and so on. But the woman appears three times in the Gospel of John. At the cross, at Cana, where he says, Woman, what have you to do with me? My hour is not yet. So the woman and the hour are always connected. At Cana, the mystery of the wine, uh, the marriage feast, but the hour is not yet. Okay? The woman appears one other time. If you turn over, it is uh, paragraph, uh, the quotation number five. Yeah, and this shows you how bad the translation could be. The top one is RSV. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she is delivered of the child, she no longer remembers her anguish for joy that a child is born into the world. That's simply bad. It should be the, the, the next block is uh, my translation with the, with the Greek to go with it. It's second line. When the woman, it's not a woman, it's the woman. You've got the article, e yini. When the woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered of the child, okay, it's child there, she no longer remembers the tribulation for joy that a human being is born into the world. Okay? So she gives birth to a human being. Not just simply a child, it's a human being, which is what Christ ultimately is, the one on the cross. He's a human being with a woman below giving birth. Now this... Um, image of the woman in travail giving birth obviously goes back to Genesis. So five and six. The woman he said, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. But when she actually gives birth, quotation number seven, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I have gotten a man, Anthropos, a human being with help of the Lord. Okay. So the, the, the mystery of the woman who appears in Cana, in the word of consolation that Christ gives to his disciples as he's about to go, when a woman's in travail, the woman's in travail, she, her, her, her pain will no longer be remembered because joy that a human being has come into the world. That's Christ himself, the first human being. Yeah? And then standing at the foot of the cross. All of these images tie back together with Genesis in very interesting ways. So quotation, quotation number eight, as Adam was a figure of Christ, Adam's sleep sketched out the death of Christ, who was to sleep a mortal slumber, so that from the wound inflicted on his side might be figured the true mother of the living, the church. Okay? So Adam's put to sleep, and out of his side comes a rib, which is built up into the, into the woman, who is said to be the mother of the living. Eve. But she in fact turns out to be the mother of the dead. All her children die. Yeah? When Christ is put to sleep, the one of sleep, the one of whom Adam's a foreshadowing, Christ is put to sleep, from his side comes out blood and water. Yeah? The church, baptism and Eucharist. The church who turns out to be the real mother of the living. So this play between the two of them. Again, Gospel of John is so fruitful in what it does. Um, one further thing, then we we'll turn to the last quotation, and I will give you time before the next one, especially Reynolds, just to take his breath. Uh, in the Gospel of John, in the resurrection encounters, Mary is in the garden. She sees Christ, and who does she think it is? The gardener. Why does she think it's the gardener? Why does she, so go, go back to Genesis, yeah? It's not good for Adam to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper fit for him. Out of his side, he takes a rib, builds the rib up into a woman, and he leaves the woman to Adam, yeah? What would the woman say to Adam when she comes to him? What would she say? What would Eve say to Adam when she comes to him in Genesis 2? No, what would she, what would she say? How, yeah, are you the gardener? 
Yeah? The way Adam has been identified is as a gardener. Adam was placed in the garden to work it. Yeah? Now Eve is brought to him and says, are you the gardener? Yeah? This is recapitulated in Christ and Mary in the garden after the resurrection. He's playing on all of this. No, it's not written, but, but, but it is written that he was put in the garden to work it. He is the gardener. So the only way that Eve would have known him is as a gardener. And so Mary sees the risen Lord and says, are you the gardener? Or thinks he's the gardener. Okay, one final quotation, then we will take our break. Um, take us up. Christ says, woman, behold your son. And then to the son, he says, woman, uh, son, behold your mother. Okay? And we all read it in terms of he's looking after Mary thereafter. But look what Origen does, quotation number nine. And we'll finish with this. We might dare say then that the Gospels are the first fruits of all Scripture, but that the first fruits of the Gospels is that according to John, whose meaning no one can understand who has not leaned on Jesus' breast nor received Mary from Jesus to be his mother also. For if Mary had no son except Jesus, in accordance with those who hold a sound opinion of her, and Jesus says to his mother, behold your son, and not, behold, this man is also your son, he has said equally, behold, this is Jesus, whom you have born. For indeed, everyone who's been perfected no longer lives, but Christ lives in him, and since Christ lives in him, it is said of him to Mary, Behold your son, the Christ. So the beloved disciple, standing by the foot of the cross, has put on the identity of Christ, like we saw with Blandina, and like we saw with ourselves, becoming the body of Christ. He's put on the identity of Christ, and Christ's mother is now his mother, as the virgin mother, the church. Okay? Uh, Ephraim does the same thing in quotation number 10, but you can look at that. And it becomes fairly common thereafter. Okay, uh, I see other people coming in. I think we're really being urged to finish. Yes. I have a question. Go on then. Can we go back to the difference between the synoptic gospels and the gospels? No, because it gives the interpretation as the synoptics have it, but then raises it to a whole new level. But the synoptic gospels, they tell the story while okay, pretending they that they, they didn't. It, whereas he tells it from the beginning. Yeah, he, he tells something, but he takes it to a completely another level. Yes, but yeah. No, I don't think it's a spoiler. Uh, I think it could only be read as a spoiler if you're reading it as equivalent to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, rather than a further level of reflection upon this. In quite mind-blowing ways, when you start to hear all the echoes of Scripture he's playing with in all of this. Yeah. And we, we were just scratching the surface now in, in all of this. Okay. Thank you very much. My pleasure.